All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the background lecture on Natasha Trethewey in the American Literature Class, 1865 to present. Dr. Graham here. Um, some background on Natasha Trethewey and why she is one of the most relevant poets in the American Academy and in poetry today. If you don't know, she was the Poet Laureate of the United States um, during the Obama administration for three years. She served as a New York Times columnist where she wrote a feature in the New York Times on poetry that was being published at that time. And as part of that, she would take all the outcoming collections of poetry and have some lowly, poorly suffering, badly paid grad students, who happened to be me, read all of them and give her the cream of the crop to see what would fit the formatting and topical guidelines she wanted to include in her you know, very sparse, as far as word count goes, column for the Times. And so that was a great experience because I got to learn a bit about not only the process of doing this kind of editorial publication work, but also about her own stylistic preferences as an editor and as a writer, which tells a lot to, or a lot about, the, the way she fancies the craft of poetry as well. As we go through our talk today, we'll kind of hit upon these similarities and kind of see how some of these same ideas about the place of poetry in society, ideas about the poet as a custodian of culture, a poet as a custodian of language and experience come out. So, so let me first kind of foreground these ideas in Natasha's work and her own uh, scholarly and academic life is she is very focused as a poet on the value of personal experience speaking back to larger cultural trends. Now, this isn't to say that we should, if I stub my toe today, I should go write a poem or Natasha would write a poem about, oh, my personal experience of stubbing my toe is so terrible and tragic and I should be, you know, immortalized in the Sistine Chapel or in Westminster Abbey because of my toe stubbing. No, it's not that. It is that individuals who endure experiences, especially those that are um, traumatic or that are related to a certain cultural milieu have the ability to relay those experiences to kind of put a mirror up to the larger culture and then serve as a corrective or at least a reckoning with that kind of a cultural power structure. An example of this um, would probably be Natasha's poetry and the dialogue that was going on then and is currently and will be for probably ever more concerning racial relations in the United States of America. Tatha is a southern poet. She was born to a, a white father and a black mother. Uh, her father was a veteran who suffered from PTSD and was in Vietnam. She lived in kind of a not picturesque household growing up. And, and so she has a lot to say based upon her world view uh, to the different stresses and you know, prevailing differences in culture or the, the points of conflict we have today. Uh, and so that's why I think that talking about experience as a way to reflect and talk to culture is important to her relevance as well as her work as a whole. Again, this isn't an idiosyncratic, oh, I'm just glorifying myself as a brilliant poet who's going to tell the world how it should do stuff. No. It's an awareness of the culture, the history, the trends, and a seeing of oneself's own experiences as valuable in that dialogue, not to dominate it or take it over or replace it. All right, um, so that said, let's look a little bit at um, some of Natasha's poems we have in the anthology, I think are elucidative of her, uh, what she's doing with poetry and what she's doing with culture and language. So one of her first or her first big New York Times bestseller was a cycle of sonnets called Native Guard. You might think, well that's weird, why are there cycles of sonnets that are being New York Times bestsellers in the 2000s? It's because Natasha does something very different with a sonnet, um, or, or she has a different idea of how a sonnet speaks to moments of time and different ideas of place and power dynamics right? that becomes relevant to the current moment. Um, so we think about these sonnets, uh, there's 12 of them in the Norton Anthology. We're going to look at the first two, I believe. Um, she provides epigraphs and she provides dates as the titles, right? And so we should do a little research and pull up uh, on Wikipedia 
what this date she has as a title of each poem could be possibly referring to. So there's a little homework assignment for you all as we go. Native Guard. If this war is to be forgotten, I ask in the name of all things sacred, what shall men remember? Frederick Douglass. So, Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist, right, Civil War era, um, talking about what happens after the war is over. If we forget the Civil War and what was fought for, the people who suffered, and the goal of that, right, well, is there anything actually more important than the sacrifices and the purpose of that? The question is, he thinks no, or the answer is he thinks no. And yet we still have the divisions in the country today. We still have the inequities. We still have the tensions. We still have the violence and hatred and bigotry today, right? So this question is posed because we kind of already know the answer. It's not the answer Douglas wanted us to get to, right? So she's framing her poetry collection with that. So November 1862. Truth be told, I do not want to forget anything of my former life. A landscape song of bondage, dirge in the river's throat, where it churns into the gulf, wind in trees choked with vines. I thought to carry with me, want of freedom, though I had been freed. Remembrance, not constant recollection. Yes, I was born a slave, at harvest time, in the parish of Ascension. I've reached thirty-three, with history of one younger inscribed upon my back. I now use ink to keep the record. A closed book, not the lure of memory. Flawed, changeful, that dulls the lash for the master, sharpens it for the slave. All right, so that's on page 1185 in your Norton. Um, it's the first sonnet in, in Native Guard. And so what does she do? Immediately she begins talking back to Douglas. He says, I ask in the name of all things sacred, what shall men remember? She says, truth be told, I do not want to forget anything of my former life. Right? And so you have an opposition that's being set up in her poetry. She does this very well in all the sonnets you'll see in a lot of her work in general. She'll take a, a, a epigraph, a quotation, a thought a, a, from a thought leader, and she will push back on it or complicate it or challenge it with her verse. And so she's very deft with the way that she constructs dialogues, not only with cultures and cultural figures, right, but with historical figures and movements as well. And so you have here a poem, right? And remember, it's hard to tell by the rhyming of it, right, that it's a sonnet. It doesn't have the sing-songy sonnet bits that you would expect from Byron or Shelley. Um, I met a man from an antique land who said two vast and trembles. Like, it's not the same pentameter rhyme scheme that we have in sonnets from Shelley. We'll continue part two in a second. You can talk as long as you want now. Communicate to people. Either that we're filming. Well, it's fine. I just, I just made it part one over, so you all can handle whatever. I'm not. I wasn't trying to distract it. Take as much time as you like. Whatever. It's like events collided. That was, that was fantastic. Fantastic. Well, thank you. But uh, I was curious, why, why is this? The, Frozen. I believe because the resolution I was recording at, it couldn't pick up that much. So the video file should still be saved, right? Because you know it like would unfreeze at some point in time, and it should be good. We'll see. 